Hello and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the High Value Manufacturing Catapult and ourselves at Manufacturing TV. For the last two years, universities and government agencies have been working with manufacturers and training providers to create a new skills framework that will serve the drive towards the electrification of the UK economy. It's hugely ambitious. It calls for a step change in the way that skills are defined and delivered. And let's not forget, some of these skills may not even be known to us as we accelerate towards that goal of net zero 2050. Joining me to discuss the Electrification Skills Framework and Forum, to give it its formal title, uh, Tony Harper. Uh, he's director of the Faraday Battery Challenge uh, at UK Research and Innovation. Before that, he was engineering research director at Jaguar Land Rover. I should have said that the Faraday Institution, together with Warwick Manufacturing, manufacturing group at the University of Warwick and the high value manufacturing catapult were the ones charged with creating this new framework. Dr. Ben Silverstone is the electrification skills framework lead at WMG and in fact co-authored this report. Verity Davidge is policy director at Make UK. Before that she was head of skills and education at Make UK so she has a very obvious interest in this topic. And Alan Lindsay is group sales manager at Tanlin, a laser cutting business in Prestwick in Scotland. Tanlin designed and built the world's first stencil laser cutting system, and now they export machines all over the world. The developing EV and battery industry in the UK is a key market for them, particularly as they'll be using British designed and built machines to serve its needs. You can ask questions of the panel. Uh, there's a Q&A box just at the bottom of your screen. Click on that. I'll collate the questions and put them to the panel after our discussion. So let's get cracking. Tony Harper, the framework says a fresh approach to skills is required. Where are we on this journey? Uh, well, if we're talking about electrification, um, fairly, fairly early on. Um, I mean, my background is in is in automotive. And um, one of the things, one of the thoughts that struck me was maybe people think that um, that automotive skills are just transitioning from one state to another, having been in that the initial state for quite some time. Actually, the automotive skills have been of need of needed transformation over the past few years, um, mainly driven by increased electronic features, software, and so on. So some of you will have seen the, the launch uh, material of the new Range Rover, for, for example, and the, the, you know, the, the level of, fe of feature software software over the air and so on has been driving a, a skills revolution in automotive actually for quite some time even before you start start changing how the car is propelled um, so if you add if you add electrification um, on top of that which obviously throws away an awful lot of expertise in terms of anything to do with internal combustion engines and so on um, then 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 it's a very very significant transformation and you know, the reason that I think we're all we're all here is is that, and also that transformation doesn't just apply to car companies. It, it's all the people that need to deal with cars, the service centres, the rescue services, the maintenance, uh, the, the all of the manufacturing skills as well. It means that it, it is su it's such a it's such a shift, and it has to happen in such a short space of time. You know, um, over the over the next few years that. A, a really significant and coordinated um, uh, effort is required to, to make it happen. Yeah, you mentioned some interesting thoughts there, Tony, about that coordination, about the transition from legacy internal combustion engine based automotive industry and others towards electrification. We'll get on to some of that. I just want to sort of get a sort of quick roundup before we uh, get deeper into it. If I can turn to Ben, uh, you co authored this report. Talk us through what the skills challenges are in, in, in some detail, because uh, in, in, the, in the way that the report does spell them out. I think there's, there's two aspects to this. There's the actual skills themselves. So the fact that you know, things like large scale battery manufacture um, you know, in the UK is, is a new thing for us. Um, there are areas of um, the technologies related to electrification that we are not strangers to, that we have you know, significant manufacturing uh, capacity, um, but we haven't traditionally used them in this country. So, for example, you know, power electronics and motors, we make a lot of those. We export 
the vast majority of them. So there are issues for you know, skills in manufacturing, then there are issues around um, you know, skills for the supply chain, logistics, skills for um, what I'd like to you know, call end users like auto manufacturers, um, you know, skills then in terms of recycling, reuse, all of these kinds of things. So in fact, it's not just a skills shift, it's a societal shift. You know, there's an entire mindset shift that's going on here. And it's not just about transitioning from one technology to another. It is, you know, it is, it is a huge shift. And um, that particular quote that you started with, it, it's not just about the skill itself, it's how they're delivered. And the UK education system fundamentally is not set up to handle uh, future skills needs very, very, you know, particularly well. You look at universities, um, you know, the design of a degree, um, then you know, you've, got to, you've got to prove the market before you can design a degree in the UK. You design it, you deliver it. By the time you get your first graduates, you're graduating from a course that was designed four or five years ago. It's not that that's that's not really you know keeping pace with the fact that you know we have skills needs now that are completely different to the ones that were there sort of four or five years ago. So what we wanted this report to also do is to challenge that education institution, say we need to get better at collaborating, we need to get better at looking forwards, designing skills for the future, creating the environment in which the technology can thrive rather than waiting for the technology to arrive and then panicking about skills shortages. So a shift in what those skills are, but also a shift in the way that we go about designing and delivering the solutions to them. Fascinating stuff there, Ben. Well, again, we'll get into that a little deeper. Um, but Verity, uh, I, I was struck when I read this report um, at the, the sort of multi-layered uh, approach and, 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 the, and the multidisciplinary approach that it advocated and called for. Um, I thought it was a very impressive template. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I think that the framework um, that's been published is, you know, will be actually really welcomed by industry because actually it suggests this national approach. And I think sometimes we get too dug into the detail of taking a sector approach, a regional approach, and actually what we often need to do is just fat you know, fix that national picture. Um, and I think actually, and you know, Ben just alluded to this right now, just taking that first step into defining what skills are needed is a really important one. It's a really difficult job to do when we're talking about uh, you know, jobs for the future and trying to determine what the skills we, are, we need now. Um, and I think, and again, we'll probably come into this a bit, little bit later, there always needs to be a degree of flexibility because we can think what we need now, you know, we can try to predict what we want for the need for the future, but actually as we get closer, we realize we need to kind of evolve um, over time. I think what I would say is, you know, we are, it's this once in a, in a generation opportunity here. Um, the, you know, we are in the week of uh, COP26 and there's huge opportunities to showcase, you know, manufacturing. But if we are to take advantages of all of these new opportunities, opportunities that we have, we need to really secure that highly skilled workforce. And, you know, and I think as, as Ben mentioned and as some of the report findings show is we're some way off that happening. Um, so if anything, even if we can't quite predict the skills we need now, I think we need to make sure we have the infrastructure and that framework in place so that we can take advantage of all these new opportunities. Alan, uh, your company Tanlin uh, is not huge, uh, not unlike about 95% of the UK manufacturing sector. Does this initiative give you any cause for optimism that the skills you're going to need in the coming years will be coming through the system? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we do well from the university graduates we, we take on. Uh, we have a very grounded background. We take on school leavers. Essentially, everybody who joins learns what we do internally. There's on-the-job learning, and they all grow from that, that learning. Uh, back, back to the, uh, Tony's point about the, the shift in, uh, from electrification, I'm kind of more confident. Uh, I work in electronics, or serving the electronics industry. Essentially, it's all mechanical. Somebody designs it, an electronic circuit, we then take mechanical processes to, to make all these parts come through. And I'm, I'm hoping it's the same when we switch from 
ice to EV, then we can do the same. Manufacturing will cope. Well, yeah, I mean, manufacturing does have a, a tremendous track record of, of stepping up to the challenge. But as if you get more than two manufacturers in a room, uh, leave them there for 15 minutes or more, they'll uh, start talking about skill shortage and how they can't attract the talent. Um, Alan, at Talon, you're, at Tanlin, you're, you're, you're very blessed with the fact that you're able to, uh, to get these young people and attract the talent you need. I have to say... Um, I know that Tanlin is a highly automated and highly digitized company. Is that part of the reason why you're able to attract the talent, that you're actually quite there on the cutting edge uh, in terms of your processes and the way you do things? Yes, I think that'll play a factor. Uh, laborious tasks that no one wants to do, essentially automation takes that away. The, there's enjoyment and rewarding skills to set the automation and process. So I think, yes, that is, a, that is attractive. And we are uh, kind of five years into being uh, value providers for an automation company. That serves us in good stead for, for the, this type of work. Okay, Tony Harper, um, I, I just wanted to ask you um, about how what the next steps are in this, because it, it is an enormously complicated task, as you've already alluded to. There are lots mm. of moving parts to it. What happens next? Well, the, the framework um, sets out, uh, well, precisely that, a, a framework which decomposes the, 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 the upskilling, the reskilling, the new skilling, and so on into, into manageable modules, which I think is obviously you know, part, part of the you know, one of the key, key aspects of the um, uh, of, the, of the framework. Some of the um, curricula have been, has been developed uh, already, but not all of it. So an obvious next step is to, um, is, is to complete all of, the, all of the curricula so that we have a complete framework. But as Verity has said, it, it, it needs, it, it needs to, to be flexible, flexible over time. But, but the, 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 the first step that we've got is to, is to define the need and to create, and to create the framework. Which is good. That's that's done, and also to create the forums for the skills providers to come together, and the forums for the um, for the um, for the, the people with the needs to, to come together. So that's 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 good. As I said, we need to then then create the curricula, and then start to get people through um, uh, through through the training. So just to maybe rewind a little bit on the Faraday battery challenge, you know, the Faraday battery challenge was, was set up to, as a, in the response to the need to create a whole industry around, around batteries to serve mainly automotive, but others as well. And in true, uh, you know, I guess engineering style almost and government style, um, the, the, the initial focus was on the technology and the supply chain. We've got to get, you know, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to develop technology. We've got to build the supply chain. We've got to, get companies doing this and that and to a certain extent we forgot about the people aspect now we haven't completely forgotten about the people aspect but but it's not it's not untypical for a first response of something of this magnitude to be let's get let's get the technology and the supply chain secured and that and now in very quick succession we have to think oh, yeah, this is a this is a this is a human system as well as a technological system we're already starting to feel um, the practical effects of this. So, um, you know, the, the, the UK Battery Industrialization Centre, for example, as part of this part of my my program, we've we've created skills and, and capacity uh, capacity that they're, they are already highly sought after folks, and we're only really at the at the very beginning of the industry and the supply chain um, picking up. So, you know, one of the things that we think needs to be a next step, as well as creating the framework and the and the and the curriculum, is to get is to start getting people through uh, and, and training ahead of me to a certain extent, because we're already seeing skill shortages. Um, uh, uh, we're seeing wage inflation. Um, and actually it's, it's, not, it's not healthy, not just because it's skill shortages and wage inflation. We need, we need the pool of talent to grow the supply chain. If we're gonna put a gigafactory up in Blythe or or, or Sundon is going to need a lot of people. The suppliers are going to need a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people, and if we if they are constrained, which right now they are, then that's a huge problem. So, so we've got to figure out 
how um, we in government, uh, which is essentially what I am, a funder of research innovation, can um, can assist in providing funding for finalising the, the curriculum development and starting to get cohorts of people through the necessary training. Mm -hmm. If I can just um, follow up on that, Nick, if that's all right. I think Tony's 100% right in, in everything that he said. And looking at the next steps, the, the big challenge for us is that you, you can't do them sequentially. All of these moving parts need to move forwards together. Uh, so um, as Tony says, you know, specifying that curriculum, identifying what already exists, which we've done a lot of the work already, identifying where those gaps are, creating things to fill it, which again is, is coming along quite rapidly. So there's a lot of um, automotive electrification curriculum that's being developed, same with, with batch manufacture. Then you hit the next challenge in that there simply aren't enough providers that can do this. And in fact, that was that was a huge surprise. You know, government has this view that, you know, if you build it, they will come. And actually, you know, the capacity within our current education system is not there to deliver these skills at the scale that we need to. So it's actually quite a big piece of work to upskill educators in order to be able to provide this. So that's something else we're looking at. And then you hit the next problem is providing the physical resource to do this. Uh, you know, if you're teaching about batteries, a battery pack is not something that you bought a couple of years ago and left at the back of the store cupboard. You know, it's a, it's a, not only is it expensive, but it is a highly technical, potentially dangerous piece of kit to have lying around. So not many providers have got the actual physical equipment they need to deliver these things. And you can't just stick a battery pack in the back of someone's car and trot it around a couple of colleges because the law doesn't allow you to do that either. So we also have this next challenge of going back to government and saying, right, you want to invest in skills, that's great. We now need to invest in that physical infrastructure to underpin the delivery of skills because this isn't a business course that what we need is a classroom and a whiteboard. There's, there's a lot of physical infrastructure required for this. So we're busy sort of we're busy moving those forwards and then you know having that interface with government having those conversations but continuing the work that we're doing through the forum and for me that's the real um the real gold of this if you like is that previously you've you know we've seen um you know sector and industry divides where the auto sector will go off and do something and you know the rail sector and go and do something else where we brought them all together so sitting in the room, looking about, looking at skills, talking about skills needs, uh, rail, automotive, aerospace, utilities, local authorities, charities, education providers, everyone who needs to get involved in this are all sitting down having this conversation together, which is the best way for that collaboration to occur. And I think there's 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 a couple of there's a couple of little things I'd like us to bear in mind is that let's not talk about jobs, let's talk about careers because that's a key thing within this framework. We don't want dead ends. We don't want people just to pick up jobs and get stuck. We want, we want careers. And yes, there might be a skill shortage, but there's a huge skills opportunity. And I think this is another way of looking at it. Because if we constant, you know, if, if the message that we give, particularly to young people, is that, oh, there's a skill shortage, there's a skill shortage, it's an extremely negative way of viewing. Yes, we don't have enough of this skill. There's a massive opportunity for you to, step in and fill that gap and we want you to do that and i think that's the messaging we need to go out there with all the time to, to what extent then if i can just ask you to clarify um you've got you've, you've talked about the education providers the colleges schools that sort of thing but of course there's also a commercial uh training pro provision sector yeah. in the uk are you satisfied that they're sort of primed ready uh, set to go with this um, the moment you hand, hand them the curriculum. I'm thinking particularly of, of work in upskilling existing workforces. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And a big part of the, the next phase for the framework is to create, I don't want to say a regulatory framework because that sounds painful, but a way of ensuring that, you know, the, the quality of provision from a provider is there, that they have the requisite skills and abilities to deliver, because at the moment it's an entirely unregulated sector. If you wanted to do a childcare course, if you wanted to do, you know, teacher training, it's thoroughly regulated. Providers are inspected to ensure that they can do things and off you go. At the moment in this, there, there, there's no regulation whatsoever. The closest we've got 
is that awarding bodies like IMI or City and Guilds do vet training providers, they do hold them to a certain quality standard. So in fact, we've brought those two organisations in to help us build this network so that we can make sure that there aren't cowboy outfits going out there saying that they can deliver industry not, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but industry just not knowing any better, you know, going with the, the cheapest or whatever they can find, they buy the training in, it's not necessarily fit for purpose and, and causes issues, which is where that consistency of quality element that we, we talk about in the framework comes from. So across the piece, whether it's universities, colleges, private providers, some are ready, some are already doing it. Some aren't ready, but could do it. And others are, you know, way, way off the pace and will need a lot more work. Alan, you said that Tanlin provides on, on, on the job um, training for everybody. Is, is that training that you and your own people do or do you bring in external training providers? And are you satisfied? Well, you obviously must be satisfied with the quality of what they give you, if that's the case. It's all internal. So our laser cutting systems are built in-house. Uh, so we have the people who design them, the electrical, the software, everybody is in-house and all willing to share. Uh, we hold plus or minus three microns when we're, when we're cutting. So we have the uh, equipment to inspect that. And we would essentially look to have, if it's a, a graduate coming in, we would look to have him competent on every piece of equipment in the factory and be able to be a resource uh, as and where we, we required it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struck, um, Verity, by the, the, the way that so many companies do actually rely on their own internal resources for training. And some of them even, of course, set up their own academies within their companies. Um, to what extent do you think manufacturers uh, do that because they, they just can't rely on the formal systems, either the commercial sector or the education system itself, to bring the skills through that they want? I mean, if we were to remove the word electrification out of this discussion, we are having the same debate we would have about skills generally. You know, I think always the starkest figure for me, and it never changes whenever the government does their employer skills survey, is 30% of vacancies in manufacturing are hard to fill. We haven't cracked the nut yet and I feel like as we transition more and more to this digital and green economy it actually gets harder you know we invest in automation those lower skilled jobs you know almost become obsolete and actually what we need to do is upskill and reskill our workforce and all of our data points towards a huge shift towards including in our green skills work um, level four and level five um, qualifications and, and skill sets so you know we're talking about more of your advanced um, apprenticeships now not your intermediate ones advanced higher and the same on the kind of academic side um, I think some of the the problems that um, I think Ben mentioned um, earlier again very age-old challenges we still have companies who tell me that they have to send their apprentice 200 miles to undertake a mechatronics apprenticeship. Now, a mechatronics apprenticeship it's standard is one of the most commonly used in manufacturing engineering, yet companies are sending their apprentices 200 miles to get the training they need. You add this more you know, niche level of skills on top of that requirement, you will have companies who are saying, great, I need to move forward, I need to upskill, I need to reskill, then they can't find those providers available. I've had many, many discussions with the Department for Education previously on this, that we have never mapped out the cold spots in provision, whatever the subject matter. You can go on as an employer, you can find you know, an apprenticeship standard, you can search the postcode for if there's a provider nearby. If there, is, if there isn't, what do you do? You know, and I think we need, as part of this, you know, potentially a next step again of the framework and discussion would be really useful to start mapping out those cold spots, because actually, if we can take that to government, uh, you know, they can't actually fix it and say, right, providers set up here, there and everywhere. But I think we need to show them where those those gaps are and, you know, the opportunities associated with it. Um, and I think, you know, Ben touched upon this as well the kind of the cost 
you know, this is significant cost for providers. Everyone loves to use that hairdressing and beauty apprenticeships as an example. It's, you know, it's it's cheap to deliver. And I think, and one of the things we've been always pushing government on is support for that capital expenditure, because it's really hard for providers to make such significant investments unless they absolutely know the demand is there. Um, and that's, you know, that's the, that's the challenging part. I think employers have a role to play in that they need to try to articulate their needs as much as possible. Um, and that's back to kind of Ben and others point of collaboration. And it's great to see that the framework really focus in on that. But, you know, not to put a, put a slight dampener on it, my nervousness is we always keep on having these discussions and we haven't quite found what works. Um, so I think just coming together again and working out what it is we need and how we're going to get there is a really kind of you know positive move in the right direction. As, if I can pick up on a couple of things you say there, Verity, um, and also something that, that Alan said as well. So if we go with the, you know, we've been here before having these discussions and you're right, we have. And I'd like to think that we've managed to take more steps forwards than we've ever managed to before <laughs> off the back of it. And one of the ways we've done that is rather than just going in and saying, right, what do you want? Uh, you know, with a blank sheet of paper and, and off we go, which sometimes when you challenge industry like that, they find it difficult to articulate it in, in, in a very in very sort of positive way, which is why in the report we talk about the foresighting methodology, which is a, a, a managed, led, supported process to help identify those competencies, turn those competencies into action, and then go back to those employers. We look, here's something we've created from what you've said. Does this ring true? And then turn that into, into curriculum. So we've managed to make some, some steps forward. Um, and what you're saying about the hot spots and the cold spots, you, you're 100% right. If we look at electrification, it's the northeast and it's the Midlands. There you go. Those are your hot spots for electrification. And we know that. You've then got areas like uh, Greater Manchester, which are about to invest huge amounts of money into this because they want to be a hot spot. Unfortunately, um, what the government has done through the um, Building Skills for Net Zero document is uh, creating even higher level of skill segregation uh, because there's a chunk in there that talks about how they want to hand um, the power to decide what um, colleges and other providers actually deliver to industry. Now, that sounds very, very positive on the face of it. However, if you happen to live in a place where the vast majority of the industry around you is care homes, you know, hair and beauty and that kind of stuff, that's all your local college is going to deliver. Therefore, that's all you're ever going to be able to do unless you take that 200 mile journey to go somewhere else to do it. So actually, where we talk about this national approach, and you're right, looking at supporting providers to you know, spread it out a little bit so that we don't have to do that is going to be so important. But we're faced with um, policy that rightly or wrongly is actually going to make it even worse. And then um, the in-house training bit, which, which Alan talks about, which is great. Um, my challenge would be that does that mean that somebody who comes and works for you, Alan, and trains in your facility is only ever any, going to be any good to work in your facility because of the focused nature of your in-house mm -hmm. training? And something we talk about in the framework is, you know, um, is the workforce mobility. And we, we really, really need that. We, you know, you don't want you know, Gigafactory A having a completely different skills makeup and, uh, you know, training plan to, to factory B, to factory C. That means that, again, either the workforce is stuck or needs to do a hell of a lot of, of reskilling when they want to move somewhere else. So, you know, we want that, we want that fluid and mobile workforce that can also shift think about electrification as a as a whole and not just a collection of small subsectors you know we want somebody who might start off you know in in, a, in the kind of factory that uh that, that tony's working to establish you know on a high-speed production line making battery cells and ends up 20 years later as a senior aircraft engineer designing hydrogen aircraft engines because it's all part of the same story so in-house training is a necessity, but is, you know, again, something that really needs to think about that, that consistency of its approach. Give you a chance oh. just to come back on that, Alan, please. Yeah, yeah. No, 
Absolutely. So, so we will have apprenticeships who will uh, take on quality engineering drawings, all the kind of standard engineering stuff. We're training to use, use our machines, so they can only get that training in-house and yep. we're the best people to deliver that. So yes, it's, it's suited for within our walls, but it is transferable and it's it's good experience. The, back to Verity's point, I was an HNC Mechatronics uh, apprentice <laughs> some time ago. Uh, and it, it gives you a, an opening into a variety of uh, opportunities. We, we deal with a, a huge amount of uh, industries, electric uh, motors, battery interconnects, electronics, essentially anything thin metal, and we will put a resource towards that. Essentially, any one of our employees could end up working for one of our customers or one of our suppliers and have a, a really good base knowledge to take across mm -hmm. with them. I just going to meant, add on to Alan's point that sometimes I think that companies move some parts of their training in-house because it's a reflection of the training market not responding to their needs. And we get a lot of those frustrations that actually, they, a lot of companies don't want to move everything in-house because of that transferability point. They'd rather that learner have um, a qualification. But actually, if you're not getting what you want from the market, then your, you know, your plan B is to train in-house. And I think we do also see a lot of that happening. Tony, if I can come yeah. to you. Um, the, you, you. Tony, you sit at the interface, really, between all of this and government. I mean, you're the yeah. closest yeah. bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've heard some of the, not criticism, but perhaps levels yeah. of disquiet. Yeah. Are you satisfied that government understands that and is receptive to that? I think in principle, yes, but I think that the, 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 the devil is in some of the, the detail where we just heard, I think, some well-meaning policy that doesn't doesn't you know necessarily necessarily deliver. And in fact, I, you know, I, I think you know, I work for a UK research and innovation, they do tend to I mean concentrate on that very high-end skills, for example. So it's 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 an easy thing for us to do to run PhD programs because we fund universities, etc. It's 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 the other more holistic bits that we find that, that are more that are more difficult, and then you get into you know sort of education policy and other education funding streams in different bits of in different bits of government, and trying to pull all of that into something holistic is actually is actually quite quite difficult. Um, which is why, personally, I think uh, um, in terms of what, we're, what we are planning in the Faraday Battery Challenge, we, we are planning to have our own de dedicated significant funds for, um, for, for skills that fundamentally back the, the framework that we're talking about here. And our view will be the hotspots for that will be, as I said just now, the Midlands and, and the North and the Northeast. Once we create momentum, there will be other education funding streams that will sort of we can that will be pulled in. But I think I think we've got to provide the drive, and then look for opportunities to pull some of those other funding streams from government in, rather than hoping that that the government you know is going to come up with a grand plan uh, to support all this in a coordinated in a coordinated way. I think a number of people have said that you know over the years that. It has been quite difficult to coordinate education funding from government across geographic zones and, and up and down the education spectrum from schools all the way to to um, to PhDs and so on. And that's absolutely correct. And we can't, frankly, we can't hang about. You know, there's there's we, we need to get almost on a you know on a military footing in terms of the skills provision we need to generate in the northeast and the midlands. We're just going to do that and create the momentum um, for other opportunities to come alongside. I mean, to touch on, on some of the other things that we've talked about, uh, um, you know, partic particularly some of the vocational skills around you know, the physical handling of battery packs, battery modules, and so on, is, is not something for the amateur. Um, you know, it, it, we do, it does need significant capital equipment, safety equipment, and facilities to, uh, to provide so I can really only see very you know, either 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 in, in industry or high-end um uh private private um uh providers but more likely 
um, uh, existing institutions that are used to doing this this kind of thing or can be easily adapted to doing uh, doing this kind of thing. Um, you know, because the, 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 it is expe it's expensive, it's safety critical, um, the quality standards have got have got to have got to be there. You know, in, in some instances, particularly when we think about about whether people can do this in in house. If, if we're creating new capacity and we need to create you know, six or seven gigafactories over the next 10 years, you know, that, that existing capacity isn't there. There is no house in which to do in-house training. Yeah? So, so we will have, it will have to be um, uh, external and to a certain extent, which is the tricky bit, I'd be interested to see what the others think, Ben in particular, is, is how do you get the balance of, of doing that ahead, just ahead of need? It's almost like a just-in-time Thing you need to do. You can't you can't go too soon and create loads of loads of trained people that have got no jobs to go to. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to be you know you don't want to um, constrain the expansion of the industry through lack of skills. And I think it's quite a quite a, 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 a tricky balance to try and get that that almost just in time skills provision. One thing that we haven't talked about that I do see quite a lot actually is also when people are thinking of inward investment into the UK. So, you know, if, some, if somebody's looking at UK or Germany or US or somewhere else in order to, in order to make an investment, one of the things that one of the, there's a few key questions that they ask about government support and so on. And one of them is, is you know, what are you gonna to do to make sure that we've got the, got the skills and the manpower um, that, we, uh, that, that we need? And we, as a country, we need a credible answer to that. Um, and, and again, what we're talking about here is part, is part of that answer. Tony, a, a, a very important point, yeah. if I can just pick you up there, Tony, a, a very important point that has been made many for many years in the UK manufacturing sector is that skills training has tended to be sort of handed down from on high. Manufacturers never really uh, were consulted to any great degree, unlike in Germany, where they tended to drive the agenda and then government said, well, we'll help Im implement it. I'm sensing that what you're talking about is actually trying to move a, a lot of this drive back into the manufacturing sector, and particularly when you've got the forums uh, underway. Yeah, Perhaps well, it's, you explain it, how that, how that well, it's, a part, it's a partnership, I think, as, as Ben discussed earlier. I mean, we, we, have, um, we have got some, or uh, between us, between what was my old job in Jaguar Land Rover and WMG, we have got some precedent in doing this. We've created something called the Technical Accreditation Scheme some time ago, which is Sort of a mini version of what we're talking about here but what what we found there as as ben said if if you create a framework a hypothesis you know, it's very difficult to ask an open question of industry and say how do you want this to work yeah but if you create a framework and a hypothesis and then you get down to well we're thinking about this module here what and this is what we're thinking about in terms of the the training, the skills that you end up with at, at the end, then, then suddenly you get a conversation going that says, ah, well, wait, wait, could you add this in? Could you do this? It would be really great if this happened. And, oh, and, I've, and, and, and you know, we did something a little bit similar at Loughborough University or something, and we think they've got some skills that can help, can help with this. You get a completely different dynamic to the conversation. So it's almost too naive to talk about handing down or industry-led. You've, you've, you've got to get to a position where you can have specific conversations with experts and because obviously industry is in the end people as well. And, and you know, what we, what we did with the technical accreditation scheme was we got people with inside Jaguar Land Rover nominated as being the, the, the champions of particular modules, you know? And then you can get the, the discussion going between industry in that sense and the provider around getting, the, getting that module right working out you know how to evolve it over over, over time you build that you, you know you, you multiply that and suddenly you've got yourself um a, a framework so i don't necessarily think it's a you know ha handed down or industry led it's truly a partnership but to get to the partnership you've got to get to a, a level of granularity to have a discussion around something specific because open questions to industry you know don't don't go very far and is that what the forum is all about uh, but from my perspective, yeah, but I'll let Ben, ben, uh, ben answer that. <laughs> that's that's one hundred percent what it's all about. Um, you know, it's 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 about sort of convening these people and and you know almost asking 
the question, this is what we think the world looks like, tell us whether we're right or wrong, and then we'll we'll go from there. And you know, Tony's right, government is, you know, the role of government is not to tell us how this is going to work. The role of government is to provide the mandate for it to happen. Then it's up to the likes of us to pick that up and make it happen. And you know, we you know, we we don't have a nanny state, we can't sit sit by and, and let them do it for us. We're gonna we're gonna have to drive that forwards. And and Tony's right, you know, some of these things are a bit disparate at the minute. And we're going to need to pull funding streams together. We're going to need to challenge the establishment. But having had that mandate to say we we want to deliver these things, then we can go back to government and have that credible conversation. And say, great, you want us to deliver these things. In order to do that, we now need whatever it is we we say that we need. And and thinking about those the kind of you know, the the physical equipment and the location. Uh, an idea that we've been sort of playing with at the moment is the, the sort of learning factories idea. Which has been going on elsewhere and in other industries for, for ages, but essentially establishing you know physical locations within regions where a lot of this equipment sits. You know, we can we can focus and collect you know the expensive stuff in one place, and then it's there and available for providers to use. So you know that opens up this now as an opportunity to way, way more providers who can't afford to buy this stuff. They can upskill their people and have people who are technically competent and can handle this stuff safely and, and do all the training correctly. And then they can go along to this physical place where all of this stuff exists and, and can do it. And then the just-in-time skills thing is, is a really interesting idea, Tony. And we, we do have something for the battery industry. We have UK Big. Mm. which you know we can use as a facility to, to to train people and you almost want to go right well here's the the academic element of what you're going to learn and then just before you go into factory here are all the hands-on skills that you're going to need and you can deliver them here at, at UK Bic and then as soon as the likes of British Vault open their doors on day one you know or even you know prior to that you know day minus 50 when they're starting to install all the new kit and you know the, the technical trainers from the equipment manufacturers are in there giving the training then then in they go and, and do that so yeah it, it just continues to be this this complex landscape Nick. Verity do you feel at all encouraged by by what you're hearing in terms of a, a it feels to me certainly a, quite a, quite a new sense of energy inside uh, the, the, the academia, the agencies and manufacturers uh, to get this right. I, I, I certainly feel that this is a new kind of energy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think having, you know, as, as Ben and Tony said, actually going to employers with some form of framework and actually this is what we think you need, you know, allow them almost to kind of pick it apart if needed or, or build on it is the right approach. I think that's a, you know for some time we've always heard government policy talking about like employer led and industry led and then it's that classic leave it to employers and suddenly they think oh blank sheet of paper actually I'm going to need a little bit of help piecing it together so I absolutely think that you know we talk about the word collaboration and that's absolutely what is needed and I think is what we're seeing achieved here. And if we can make models like this work, then being able to kind of replicate that elsewhere um, when we need it, I think, absolutely. I think it's always and um, the case that smaller businesses will say, I, I want to be engaged, but I don't have the time. And, you know, but if I don't engage, will it only be larger companies being heard? And I think that's always the, the slight challenge that we have in how do we make sure we are reaching the smallest of businesses. So I think having, you know, those this forums really accessible, um, which is what I'm absolutely hearing, is definitely a you know a move forward because, um, and I think it was a comment mentioned earlier. There is always that risk that employers just go to what they know, and they go to whoever they used last, and they say, okay, I'll have five of the same as what I had last year, <laughs> um, and not even thinking about changing their approach to, you know, recruitment provision, the type of training that they need. So the more information we can give employers without them feeling like they're being spoon fed, I think is, like I say, a, a great shift in energy and positive way forward. Alan, um, SME manufacturer in Scotland. Do you feel encouraged by what you've been hearing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the, the regional part is uh, driven by uh, large companies that the Northeast has 
Nissan in the middle and it's a Jag Jaguar Land Rover. I don't think there's anything else that's going to set in that. There will need to be a similar employer, a sizable employer to put the education in different areas to make it worthwhile. If not, there's, there's not a huge amount of sense in setting up a, a college or university to specialise in something there's no factory to uh, give them jobs for. So that, that's cool. I, 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 see what, I do you see what you're saying there, Alan. And again, where we look at electrification in its broadest sense, and you start looking at rail, you start looking at aerospace, food and drink. Food and drink industry is one of the biggest um, customers for power electronics, motors and drives. You know, and and they're they're located in in you know, there's a lot of in the northwest. You've got uh, Kraft Heinz and things like that. So, actually, when you start to to take it beyond what we think of as the traditional electrification, which has naturally been led by automotive, because it's in automotive that we have the most coherent legislation from government at the moment. Once you kind of look beyond that, you realise actually it is it is a nationwide thing. It does reach across those devolved borders. You know, there's a lot going on in Scotland. There's a lot going on in Wales. They're building hydrogen and electric buses in Northern Ireland. There's, there's so much going on everywhere that, you know, there is a national game to be played. You know, with, with mining Cornish lithium, it, it literally touches, yeah, I, yeah. you know, the... the I, would, the, I would agree, actually. And, and the, yeah. the comment made earlier about cold spots is a worry for um, that we, we know where that we know where the hot spots are. Uh, and, and there's a risk that we develop cold spots, not 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 cold spots that need to be cold spots. We see, but cold spots that that, that 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 we really don't want to be cold spots. And you know, if, if you think about the, how the supply chain shifts through electrification, suddenly uh, automotive supply chain switches to to the chemical industry via the medium of batteries. Suddenly, there's a whole there's a whole need for training in the chemicals industry, which is also in Humber, the Northwest, and, 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 and many, many places. And then, yes, add in power electronics and electric machines, and suddenly you've got a, you've got a pretty, pretty uh, national national picture. So, um, and, and just sort going. of thinking, think about what Verity said, you know, in getting the, SME, you know, the, the, the SMEs and the smaller businesses voice in this. And it's something we've been so careful to do. So, you know, anytime we talk about automotive, there are certain UK-based companies that will always come in and club everybody else over the head because they're big and they want their voice heard. How we've been very careful to say, well, we don't just want them. We want the, the smaller players as well. We want good representation. Talking then to people like EU Skills or the National Skills Academy for Rail who represent all of those smaller businesses that make up that particular sector. And, you know, getting those, yes, those voices are being channeled through that particular body, but they're being heard. You know, they're not being ignored because, you know, you, your eons or your, your BPs of the world are, are dominating that conversation. And so once you, once you make sure you fill that into the mix, that again starts to plug these cold spot holes that you see all over the country because, you know, these smaller businesses are more spread out um, so yeah, it, it really is a it really is a national picture, a UK wide picture, and not not just something that you can narrow down to the Midlands and Northeast. Well, on that point, Ben, I'm going to uh, bring the discussion to a, a, a temporary halt because we're now going to take questions uh, from the people who've been watching the discussion, um, and uh, let's get to the first one. <laughs> 